Get your Bibles, please, and turn to 1 John 1. 1 John, right close to the back of the Bible. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. And 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude are very, very small. 1st John, chapter 1. <clears throat> I don't know how, how much you're on the social media, all those things like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and all those kinds of things. I'm surprised I could even remember the names. But someone had the idea of taking social media and, and applying it to their daily life. In, in other words, to where they would be able to uh, get better out in public, right? So they're going to apply some of the things to, that they'd learn like on Facebook and um, so I want to read what they did and, and the result, okay? It says, I am trying to make friends outside of Facebook while applying the same principles. Therefore, every day I walk down the street and tell passerbys, passersby that uh, just what I've eaten, how I feel in the moment, what I have done the night before, what I'm going to do later, and with whom I give everyone I meet pictures of my family and my dog and of me gardening and taking things apart in the garage, watering the lawn, standing in front of the landmarks, driving around town, uh, taking pictures of me having lunch and what I'm having and all these things. And it seems to be working. I have four followers already. Two police officers, a private investigator, and a psychiatrist. Not surprised. First John chapter one. It always amazes me. Put people have put every, and I'm far, sorry if I'm picking on somebody, but put every move they make on Facebook. You know, here's what I ate, and here's what I'm doing, and all that. Anyway, enough meddling. First John one. If you'll stand with me for the reading of God's word. First John chapter one. That which was from the beginning, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was from the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This, then, is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, that's Jesus, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I want to bring a message entitled Sweet Christian Fellowship. That's a word that you see over and over here, fellowship. Sweet Christian Fellowship. Thank you. Please be seated. You know, we have, we have all types of folks in our in our congregation um we have people from other states uh, we have people from other other uh, countries we have uh, different nationalities different races we have people that have different jobs professions we have people that in all shapes and sizes we have people with all different hair colors and and the hair presence and, and all these kinds of things. But we have something in common. And that's what I want us to look at. We have a fellowship. And we are a fellowship. Matter of fact, we're not an organization. We're an organism. We're alive. This church is alive. And we're not uh, just a business. But we're a body. And Jesus is the head of that body. And so we are members far beyond a membership. We are members of the family of God. And so therefore, because we have fellowship with him, 
we can have fellowship with others, and we do. And that's what we're going to be looking at, sweet Christian fellowship. Psalm 133, I've always liked this. It says, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren, that's brothers and sisters in Christ, to dwell together in unity. And uh, I'm thankful for the unity that we have. So I want to share with you five commonalities that results in our sweet fellowship. You have an outline on the back of your bulletin. Here's the first one. Number one, we share the same Savior. You say, well, duh. Now, don't say duh. That is the most important thing of all. We share Jesus Christ. I was listening to the songs we've been singing about Jesus Christ and how, how special they are because it's all about Jesus. We share the same Savior. Look at verse 1. It says, that which was from the beginning. Well, what does that mean? That means, that means he's always been. Yeah, he didn't get his, Jesus didn't get his start in Bethlehem, you know. He was here at creation. He was, he's always been. He's eternal. Uh, and so there was never a time when Jesus was not. And uh, so John is writing this little book to, uh, in answer to a cult. Now, don't confuse cult with occult. Okay? Some people think that demon, demon, demon worship or, or just uh, false religions or whatever are cults. Well, you could look at it that way, but that's not the real definition. A cult is a group of people that call themselves one thing, like, for instance, Christians, but they've erred from the truths of Christianity, from the fundamentals of the faith. I'll give you an example. The two most common are Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses. They call themselves Christians, but they, they've gotten away from the fundamentals of the faith, which caused them to be a cult. What are they? Well, it's actually the two most common things that, that a religion would get away from and still call themselves Christians. And, and one is, the, is denying the deity of Christ. See, you can't, you can't get away from Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Uh, it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but they're one. Okay? We believe in, in a trinity, a triune God. And Jesus was there from the beginning. And so that's one thing. The other thing that's very common is to uh, believe you've got to add something to salvation and not believing it's just grace through faith. It's, it's just faith and grace through faith. Uh, because it's, So they're believing in works. I've got to do something. I ask people, and, you, and you've heard this many times, that, you know, do you know for sure you're saved? Yes, why? Well, because I think I'm a good person. Well, that's works. You can, you're not going to get to heaven according to your works. It's not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, his grace, that we're saved, and nothing else, and you can't add to it. And, and so the devil has always made sure there's cults and isms and false religions, always, from the beginning. And, uh, and he's always, and here's the main way he does it, is that he muddies the water concerning Jesus and also concerning the gospel. Well, this is what's happening in John's day. There was a cult, and, uh, and it was the Gnostics. It was Gnosticism. Well, where did they err from the faith? Well, they taught that Jesus was not a real person in flesh and blood. They, they, they were teaching that he was maybe a phantom, a spirit of some sort. He looked like he had a body, but he didn't have a body of flesh and blood. You say, well, why is that so important? It's very important. If Jesus didn't have come to earth in flesh and blood, you could not be saved. I could not be saved. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There's no forgiveness. There's no new birth. There had to be blood. But it had to be perfect blood, spotless blood. One that never sinned. That's Jesus. That's Jesus who's God. And so he came and he laid down his life so that we could have everlasting life. But they didn't believe that. So John just blows them out of the water. He's, he, just, he just totally destroys their argument. He says, we've seen him with our own eyes. We saw him. We heard him with our ears. And when we've walked with him, we have held him. He is a literal body. He, had a, he has height and, and weight, and, and we've seen him. He, 
We've, we've heard him. And then verse 1, that which our hands have handled. Now look at that verse. It says, of the word of life. You see word there? should be capitalized in your Bible. That's because that's Jesus. We've seen him. We've heard him. We've talked with him. We've walked with him. The word. The word of life. Now, I spotted something that I've never seen. You probably have, but I never saw this before. 1 John 1, 1, he's talking about the word of life, capitalized, Jesus. But in John 1, 1, which he also wrote, the gospel, he talks about the word. In the beginning was the word, capitalized. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. By who? By Jesus. Without him was not anything made that was made. So he's the word. John 1, 1 told us. And 1 John 1, 1 speaks of the word, the word of life. Jesus Christ is the eternal fact of our faith. He's the material fact of our faith. Jesus Christ is the central fact of our faith. And I hope today, I pray today, that Jesus Christ is the personal fact of your faith. I hope you have a personal relationship with him. See, that's what's important. It's not, it's not just knowing about him. You've got to have a personal relationship with him. He, he must be your savior, but he also must be your Lord. And if he's Lord and he's savior, we can have fellowship with each other. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. See, I have the same Savior as Larry and Sharon. That's, that's reason to fellowship together. I have the same fellowship as Brian Crane. Same fellowship, uh, same Savior as Julia. Same Savior. Folks, I hope he's your Savior today. That's reason for fellowship. I hope he's your Savior and, and your Lord. Someone wrote this, Christ came not just to preach the gospel. He came so that there would be a gospel to preach. And so true. Because if he would not have come, we wouldn't have a gospel. We share the same Savior. Secondly, put this one down. We share in the joy of Jesus. We could talk about so many things here that we have in common in our fellowship. But we're just going to stick with five that John speaks about. Verse 4 says, These things write we unto you. And then he says, That your joy may be full. He's in agreement with Peter, who speaks about joy unspeakable and full of glory. Full, full of glory, full of joy. Jesus leads to joy. One of the fruits of the Spirit joy, love, joy, peace, long suffering. I hope you have joy today. I hope the joy of the Lord is your strength. What keeps you going? What keeps you motivated? I hope it's the joy of the Lord. Because everything else will falter and fail. But the joy of the Lord is constant. Praise God for the fellowship. The joy is part of sweet fellowship. I heard a story. I told this before, but it's worth repeating. D.L. Moody was visiting Charles Spurgeon. Two of the greats, the all-time greats. They were, he was visiting his church. And they're up on, the, pull, uh, up on the, uh, the, the, the platform together. And Spurgeon leans over to Moody and says, uh, Hey, remind me to tell you about that family on the front row. I'll tell you later. Well, they go and have the service. And I don't know if they go to eat or whatever. But Moody said, Now, what were you going to tell me about that family on the front row? He said, Well, what I want you to know is they were one to Christ with a smile. And, uh, and, and Moody goes, I don't understand. He said, well, it, it happened like this. I had my Bible under my arm. I was walking to work one day. I looked up, and there was a little child in the window just looking at me. So I smiled, and they smiled. And I nodded, and that little child nodded. And I went on, went on to church. The next time I came through, there were two children. And they were both looking, and I smiled, and they both smiled, and I nodded, and they both nodded, and I went on to church. The next day, there was more kids in that window, and the same thing happened. And then, another day after that, the mother, evidently the mother, was in the window with the kids, 
And then I'm thinking, oh, I don't know. I don't know about this. But he said, I went ahead and smiled, and I went ahead and nodded, and they reciprocated. The next Sunday, he said, I was on my way to church, and they weren't in the window. But I went on to church, and as I walked, it wasn't long before that, there were five kids following me to church. And, uh, and they went to church, and he, and he said, they loved our church, and they loved me. And they went home, and they begged their parents to go to church, and they did. And that whole family has come to know Christ as Savior and Lord. You know, we all need fellowship. We all need encouragement. We all need to be lifted up sometimes. We all need acceptance. We need, we need you're important to me. We need that. You know, when I come to church, I'm not just saying, God, you're important to me. I'm also saying, you, you're important to me. You're important to me. It's so important to encourage each other, even with our presence. There's been times I've preached, and, and honestly, I'll just be transparent for a moment. I feel like, wow, honestly, it, it, it didn't come out right. It just wasn't that good at all, and, and get a little down, and, and that can happen. And then somebody comes up and says, Wow, Pastor, thank you for that message. That's just what I needed. It was for me, and it meant so much to me. And it just lifts me up a little bit. Anybody that doesn't say they need encouragement will lie about other things as well. We all need encouragement. Mark Twain, who was not a Christian, by the way, he said he could live three weeks on one compliment. We all need some compliment. Everybody does. So appreciate the people around you. Appreciate, appreciate your Sunday school teachers. Appreciate the staff. Appreciate the, the singers, the musicians. Appreciate the ushers. Appreciate the security that's out there in the heat. Appreciate the nursery workers. Appreciate folks that may not even have a job yet. Just appreciate and love each other. It's the joy of Jesus that keeps us going. The joy of the Lord is your strength. All right. Number three. We share in the light of Jesus. We share the same Savior. We share in the joy of Jesus. But we share in the light. This is very important. He says in verse 5, God is light. You see that? And in him is no darkness at all. That's very key. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And then in verse 7, it says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. So, all Christians are walking in the light. If you're saved, you're walking in the light. But all lost people are walking in darkness. And that's across the board. See, the Bible said in John 3.19... This is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. And everyone that doeth evil does not like the light. He doesn't come to the light, again, because his deeds are evil. It's very applicable today because you see a lot of hatred towards Christianity. Somebody's just trying to share the gospel so they could go to heaven, so somebody could go to heaven, so somebody could get saved, so somebody could have their sins forgiven. And yet, there's so much hatred towards Christianity. And you're seeing it more and more here in the United States than we've ever had before. Of course, in other places, they're being put to death and have been. But, but you're seeing this more and more people fighting against Christianity, against the Bible, against churches, against preachers or evangelists or missionaries. They're fighting against it. Why? Because they're walking in darkness and they hate the light. That's what the Bible says. They hate the light. 
I'm so thankful that we are in the light. Jesus is the light. And if we're in him, we're in Christ. You know, when we were in darkness, and by the way, every one of us was, did you know we had nothing in common with Jesus? When we were in darkness, before we got saved, we had nothing in common. Why? Because he's light, and we're darkness, and we're walking in darkness. But he came. He came and became one with us that we might become one with him. He came to earth that we might go to heaven. And you'll never know God apart from Jesus. Let me be very clear. I know I say this a lot, but I, it needs to be said. There is no way to God apart from Jesus. There is no way. There's no other way. You say in preacher that Christianity is the only right one? Yes, 100%. You're saying Jesus is the only way. What about people that are good people that don't believe in Jesus? They need to get saved. They need to come to Christ. If they don't, they'll perish. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. But he that believeth not shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. I'm thankful for the light of the Lord Jesus. That's our fellowship is the light and the joy. I, I heard about... Um, a man that was walking through a village many years ago, and he saw some chickens over, over in a yard, and all these chickens had red ribbons tied on their wings and their feathers, red ribbons. And he didn't think a whole lot about it. He walked on, and, and then he saw some over here, some chickens, all had red ribbons on them. And then he's like, huh, that's interesting. They must have got out of their yard and went over here. Some kid's been playing, you know. And then he goes on, and then there's some more chickens in somebody else's yard, and they all got red ribbons. <laughs> and then some more in another place. And so he's thinking, I've got to find out what's going on here. All the chickens in this whole village, they all have red ribbons. So he stopped and asked somebody, why do they all have red ribbons? He said, oh, that's easy. It's to keep those hawks away. We have some vicious hawks that'll take them. And it keeps them away. He said, well, it just seems interesting. They're all red. How come some don't put blue ribbons or yellow ribbons or green ribbons away? He said, oh, we tried it. It didn't work. No ribbons work. No colors work except the red ribbons. Somehow the hawks are afraid of that. You know, Satan is afraid of the crimson blood of Jesus Christ. We share, we share, that's number four, in the cleansing blood Praise God for the blood, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now, the world, this is where we lose the world. The world doesn't get this one. That, that, that doesn't make any sense to them, this blood. And, uh, and they, they, they don't understand. But that's our, that's our bond of fellowship. Praise God for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love those old bloody songs. There's power in the blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You want to write this verse down. If you might know it already, but write down 1 Peter 1. 18. 1 Peter 1 18. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious what? Blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. If you're here today and you've been saved, it's because of the blood of Jesus. Make much of the blood of Jesus. I looked up the richest people right now, the richest guys, Jeff Bezos. 200 billion. And then there's Elon Musk and, and on and on. Zuckerberg, Gates, Warren Buffett. If these guys, the wealthiest people in the world, if they all put all of their money together, ain't going to happen. But if they did, 
it would not purchase the salvation of one person. Not one. That's what he says. It's not by silver or gold. It's just the blood, the precious, precious blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. Number five, we share in the forgiveness from sin. If we walk in the light, verse 7, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, here it is, cleanseth us from all sin. Because of that blood, I've been forgiven. Folks, I wouldn't want you to even know a tenth of sin I've committed in my life. And yet, it's all under the blood. It's washed away in the blood. Every, everything, every thought, every word, everything that I've ever done in my life that's not right, it's been washed in the blood of Jesus. I've been forgiven. Oh, I'm thankful for the forgiveness. We have that in common. We've been forgiven. Forgiven. Let me close with this. There's a story came from the, a book, Miracle on the River Kwai. And some Scottish soldiers were forced by the Japanese captors to labor on a jungle railroad. But what was really, really bad, the morale had degenerated to barbaric behavior. In other words, the prisoners couldn't stand each other. The prisoners. Generally, they bond together to be against the, the ones, the enemy. But the, the, the morale, it just, it just uh, catapulted and in, in in, in fallen down and fallen away. And, boy, they were just fighting and bickering all the time, and they just couldn't stand each other. And, and then one day, they were having a roll call type thing for the prisoners, and, and there was a shovel missing, one shovel missing, and the captain, the, the, the guard... Uh, officer in charge he came in and they when he found out he said who took the shovel he said you better step forward or everybody's going to pay well nobody stepped forward he said bring me my rifle they brought him his rifle he put it to the head of one of the men he said I'll kill every single one of you unless whoever took the shovel steps forward and admits they took it. Well, one of the men knew he was serious. He'll kill every one of us. So one of the men stepped forward. The officer, the Japanese officer, handed his rifle back, and he took the shovel, and he beat the man to death right in front of all the prisoners. He killed him right there. Well, a little bit later... They go to another area, and they find out there was never a shovel missing. It was just a miscount. This man had died. He didn't, he didn't take a shovel, but he knew he was saving the lives of others, so he stepped forward. And when they realized that, everything changed. There was no more hatred. There was no more killing. It was just, it was over. Sacrificial love has transforming power. And then these guys, these Scottish people were released. And now they're standing in front of all these that had been brutal to them. But they wouldn't retaliate in any way. What they said is, no, what we need now is forgiveness. Forgiveness. You know, we're the captives, folks. We're the captives in prison prison of sin all of us all have sinned there's none righteous no not one all have sinned we're all guilty we're in that prison camp of sin but praise God if we trust Jesus Christ we're washed in the blood we're forgiven now we can have the joy of the Lord now we can walk in light 
we always walked in darkness, but now we can walk in light. No wonder there's a sweet fellowship among Christians. I love to meet Christians other places and to find out they're Christians. You know, we, we'd be on a cruise or somewhere, and, and um, one, of the, one of the things, I wear that cap that says um, that I love Jesus, right? That we gave it one of the, one of the uh, uh, Father's Day gifts. And I wore that a lot on the cruise. And, and, and people would just come up, like that cap, like that cap. I'd say, you're, you're a Christian? Oh, yeah. It's just sweet fellowship with Christians. I like to see people wearing Christian shirts, and I'll always comment, boy, I like your shirt, because that's a Christian. Usually, most non-Christians are not going to wear Christian shirts. But that's a, that's a sweet fellowship, not just at Greenwood Village, but all Christians, true born-again Christians, have sweet fellowship. I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I hope you enjoyed this message about sweet Christian fellowship. See, if it doesn't make sense to you, you may not have that. You may not have Jesus. Or you may not know you're saved. 